Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, welcome to the regular meeting of the Police Advisory and Accountability, Accountability Committee meeting on Wednesday, today, July 17th, 2024. I will ask Lieutenant Everly to please call the roll. Thank you. Member All? Present. Member Alvarez? Present. Member Davidi? Present. Member Nguyen? Present. Vice Chair Tokalagi? Present. Chair Kamina? Present. Member Locks? Present. Member Ruiz? Present. And Member Valdez is absent. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Lieutenant Everly, will you please address the interpretation and the public comment for this meeting? Yes. Thank you, Chair Kamina. Before we begin, we'd like to announce that tonight's meeting will include Spanish language, simultaneous and consecutive interpretation provided by qualified interpreters on the Spanish channel. If watching on Zoom, you can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in the Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. If you are attending in person and don't have access to the Zoom meeting from your mobile device, please come and see me and I will get you set up with a device so you can listen to the meeting in Spanish. As a reminder, we ask everyone participating tonight to speak slowly, our interpreter, to allow our interpreter to effectively express your comments. Antes de comenzar, nos gustaría anunciar que la reunión de esta noche incluirá interpretación simultánea e consecutiva en español proporcionada por intérpretes cualificados sobre el canal de español. Si ven a través de Zoom, puede unirse al canal de español haciendo clic sobre el icono de interpretaciones sobre la barra de funciones de Zoom que ahora aparece como un globo terraqueo. Si asiste en persona y no tiene acceso a la reunión de Zoom desde su dispositivo móvil, vengan a verme. Le configuraré un dispositivo para que pueda escuchar a la reunión en español. También, como recordatorio, les pedimos a todos los participantes de esta noche que hablen lentamente para permitir que nuestros intérpretes expresen sus comentarios de manera efectiva. This meeting tonight is being recorded and members of the Public Watch online or listen by phone by calling 669-444 9171 using the meeting ID 898-5264-7245 pound. There will be an opportunity for public comment for those participating in person. Each person will have two minutes to provide their comments. We invite each of you to introduce yourselves by name before presenting your comments. We are offering closed captioning for this evening's meeting on Zoom Please select the live transcript button on Zoom to enable this feature. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Everly. Um, so the first item on our agenda is to review and approve the regular minutes from the meeting of July 17th, 2024. Um, do any of the committee members have questions about the minutes? Oh, seeing none. Um, I There are no members of the public that I see, so I guess there'll be no public comment. Um, also, is there, the next thing would be, is there a motion to, and a second to approve the minutes? I'm sorry, did you have a question? My apologies. And I have presented this question to um, Lieutenant that um, some feedback that I've been getting about the minutes although they are action items, some of them don't indicate just enough information to know what was going on on some of the items. So I just wanted that for the record that there has been community input about, I read it and I don't want to know what it means. Um, and then my second thing is, is, is there full membership? I'm not a voting member today. I was questioning that. I think I'm not voting today. I think not because the only person missing is member Valdez. So we oh, have okay. a quorum. Are, you have a quorum. Or be, okay. Is that yes, you're correct. Okay. Thank you. That thank you. Good. And thank, thank you for you. your comments. Mm -hmm. Um any other comments or questions? Okay. Given that, is there a motion and a second to approve the minutes? 
please. A motion to approve. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second? To approve. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can we have, so, so there is a motion and a second. And so Lieutenant Eberly, could you please conduct the roll? Sure. Thank you. Member Alm? Approve. Member Alvarez? Approve. Member Davidi? Approve. Member Nguyen? Member Ruiz? Approve. Vice Chair Tokalahi? Approve. And Chair Kamina? I approve. Thank you all so much. So the minutes are approved. Um, this is the time for open, uh, excuse me, the open time for public expression. And I see no public, so there will not be, there's no need to do that. So we'll move on to the next agenda item, um, which is providing feedback on the San Rafael Police Department's violent, domestic violence presentation was at our last meeting. So, um, Madam Chair, yes, if I may, please, before you uh, conduct the rest of the uh, meeting uh, business, uh, I wanted to make an introduction, if that's okay, at the onset of the so. meeting. Absolutely, please. I wanted to uh, formally introduce a new member of our team. Uh, Teresa Olson is uh, sitting at the staff table with uh, Lieutenant Eberly. Uh, Ms. Olson was uh, brought on to the organization to support the PAC. So uh, she is she's an analyst that uh, works for the police department. And just to share a little bit about Teresa, her law enforcement career started uh, in 1997 with the Benicia Police Department as a police aide. Uh, she transitioned to a two-decade career in police communications where she served as a dispatcher, uh, communications training officer, and a dispatch supervisor. She's certified by the California Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission with uh, a basic and intermediate and advanced uh, certificates as well as a supervisory certificate. Her... Uh, Expertise continued beyond law enforcement uh, when she has been involved in pivotal roles such as a senior administrative clerk and a management analyst, too, for the city of Benicia. She's also served um, as an adjunct um, instructor or professor for the Napa Valley College. Uh, before joining our team, Teresa held the role of administrative analyst um, in the professional service or excuse me, the professional standards unit of the Vallejo Police Department. Uh, her academic achievements include a Bachelor of Science degree, excuse me, a Bachelor of Arts degree uh, in management from St. Mary's College, go Gales, <laughs> uh, as well as her Master of Science in Criminal Justice from California State University, Sacramento. So uh, we feel very privileged to have Teresa join our team. She'll be working to support the needs of this committee and uh, supporting Lieutenant Eberly uh, in the administration of the PAC. So welcome, Ms. Olson. Well, thank you, Chief, for that wonderful awesome. introduction, and thank you so much. I was privileged to sit on the oral board that um, hired you, and obviously the board did a great job because you seem like quite competent, and we're very happy to have you here. Thank you. Um, so, anything else about that? Our first agenda item, then, is to... Um, provide feedback on the presentation from last month, which was the San Rafael Police Department's domestic violence presentation. Um, is there a staff report on that? There is. Well, surprise. I would <laughs> I would be happy to present it. Thank you. Um, so a good evening um, at our last meeting. Um, for those of you that were there, and I know that those of you that weren't were able to watch it mm -hmm. in, re in recorded version. Uh, we heard from Detective Lor Lorena Vega with our investigations unit and Luz Alvarado, who is a, a program director for the Center for Domestic Peace. During the last month's meeting, we learned about the complex complexities of domestic violence and some of the services that are offered to the victims, as well as the cooperation that goes between victim services and the police department. My hope is that it was helpful to understand that although domestic violence is prevalent in our city, we are doing our part in breaking that cycle of violence and providing compassionate victim-centered services. Although we outlined some of the statistics in that meeting last month, there was a call for more. Uh, we agreed, um, we, not we, uh, our new PAC analyst, Teresa Olson, was able to uh, provide more detailed statistics, which we published online 
this afternoon and we emailed the committee also this afternoon. And a summary of that, um, which you hopefully all have in front of you, will show that the majority of the domestic violence is in the canal neighborhood. Um, it is listed on your data sheet um, under beat three. So beat three in um, the makeup of San Rafael is the canal district. Um, and the majority of the victims are Hispanic females and the majority of the suspects are Hispanic males, I think was one of the questions that was addressed. Um, I will definitely entertain any other questions that you might have um, that comes out of those statistics. Um, but just to reemphasize um, the importance of the training that the police officers go through. Um, there are over, I think, 200 domestic violence calls that we responded to last year. It's not only inclusive uh, to the canal area, it is um, evident all throughout our city. And we take all those cases very seriously. And we're happy to work with all of our, our victim services to um, try to break that si cycle of violence. Um, moving on, member locks asked a question if the Center for Domestic Peace um, use services, I think it was titled man to man services. Um, I was able to research and uh, confirm with the C Center for Domestic Peace is they don't use that particular service, but they do use a battered interventions program for men. Um, it is listed on their website, um, and the title of it is called Mankind. So you can go on their website and uh, Google Mankind, and you'll be able to find all the detail about their men's services. Another question uh, was posed um, is, why don't we honor or enforce restraining orders, international restraining orders from any other countries other than Canada? It's a very good question. Um, it is because our two governments uh, have entered into reciprocity, um, an agreement where Canada will enforce the United States domestic violence restraining orders, and we will enforce Canada's domestic violence restraining orders. Because of that agreement, it was codified into law, into the family code, and therefore it is enforceable. Um, there are other countries that that, that I should say that's the only country that our government entered into reciprocity with. Um, but I do want to emphasize uh, here in San Rafael, if someone were to come from a different country that had a different country's restraining order, we would not be negligent and, and dismissive. Um, there we would do everything in our power to find out, you know, if that person is still stalking that victim, is still harassing that victim, and we would do everything in our powers to see if there would be applicable California laws where we can use to arrest um, or detain or seek out another restraining order here in California. Um, I understand how this is inequitable and uninclusive, but unfortunately, San Rafael on its own can't enact a code, a muni code, or a law that we would be able to enforce because obviously our cases go up to the district attorney's office, which is run by the governed also by the Superior Court of California. So we have to follow the laws that are in the book. Um, the committee also requested copies of both presentations. Um, they were provided in your packet as well as our domestic violence policy. Um, if there's anything else that I have missed, please uh, feel free to let me know. This concludes my staff report. Um, and just to reiterate, we are seeking your formal um, feedback to the uh, presentation on domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Everly. Um, now will be the time for the, any commi the committee members to have questions. Then the process is we'll, we'll hear from the public who is not here, but, and then we can have comments. So should we, Member Locks, would you like to thank, and thank you for asking those questions earlier. But, so just questions at this time. Uh, my first question is, um, these are statistics from last year, and I don't know which page it is, but I printed it down. Um, I'm not understanding the two columns on this particular page, which, I mean, when, what's the first column versus the second column? Ter Teresa is right next to me, and she'd be happy to answer that question for you. 
That graph speaks to the demographics. One graph is the demographic of the suspect and one graph is the demographic of the victims. You look on the page before, the title to end your column. Oh, so it continues from that page? Oh, it continues from that page. Um, is that what it does? It continues from that page? I, I can't see exactly what you're holding. Um, the, it the may column. cut off, um, yeah. but that last graph that you were alluding to where it has multicolors, that's the ethnic makeup of both the victims and the suspects. So one column is for the victim and one column is for the suspect. And I believe if you start on the left, uh, the left is the victims, the left column is the victims and the right column is the suspect. Okay. Okay, that was question number one. Question number two. Um, it wasn't clear if the victim is always advised that that the um, suspect can be released. Are they always advised that as you have? It's uh, three, oh, do I need to look up the section? 310 for one. 310 um, If the suspect is arrested, the victim is advised. I wanted to, uh, just our summary we had last month, are they always advised versus advised can be can or cannot. You know, it's a no. almost like, as written here, almost like a recommendation or suggestion, not determined. No, that's a that's a great question. And, and it is a shall and it is every time. And not only when the suspect is arrested at the time of arrest, we notify the victim that they can be bailed out of jail. Um, when we have a, a great relationship with our jail, when they are about to bail out, we put in another call for service with whatever, if they're not in our jurisdiction, usually they are. Um, to go out and contact the victim and let them know that the suspect is about to bail out. Those those are my questions. Thank you. Do any other members of the committee ha commission have questions? Question. Yes, Mr. W. Yeah. First, want to thank you for these stats. I think I was one of those people who were curious to learn more. Uh, one of the things I learned last month was that overall the trend in DV domestic violence is down, correct? In 2003, um, when does the report for obviously the year has to end? When do you guys have the new stats in for 20 in for 2024? Is that in 2025? Do you know roughly when that comes out? We'll get it out as quick as we possibly can. Um, but yeah, it's it's usually maybe late January, okay. early February. Yeah, because yeah, I'm just curious to learn to see if that trend is going down every year. Because good question. Yeah, okay. we'll we'll that we'll have them beginning of the year next. Okay, year. thank you. Yeah. Any other members have questions? I I do. My my question is, I think I have asked this though, and I don't remember, but. Do you guys work also with with numbers from other agencies, like Center for uh, Domestic Peace? Do you guys? I I don't know the affiliation of of the working like the data that they collect. Do you guys use those data too? Oh, to those or not? no, they don't share their data. Okay, yeah, there's Just, a lot of a lot of that is you know confidentiality. Right. Um. So I I. Don't know that they. I know they don't share all their data. Right. Data. And these are just the ones that comes to you. Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, again, I see no members of the public, so we won't open and close public comment. But um, I'm thinking now is the time if anyone has comments about the presentation. And recommendations? I do have a comment and recommendation. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you for answering my question it, it, on the international treaty. I was reading the policy and that really stood out to me that I have yet to meet a Canadian expat in our neighborhoods. <laughs> and I, I know that we are making a report of recommendations to our city council body, but I would like to include an addendum that would be our recommendation from this body to our legislative leaders that we consider reciprocity with other countries. 
Thank you, Member Om. Are there any other comments about the or recommendations regarding the report on domestic violence? Uh, actually, I have a comment, which is, um, you know, for so many years, this county has been so blessed to have the Center for Domestic Peace here. They have been national and global leaders in everything they've done. And uh, the CEO, um, Donna Garski, just retired this year, but Luz Alvarado, who was here, has been just a magnificent representative. Um, They've had, uh, they used to call it the, the Mankind Program, it had a different name, but they've been doing that for years. And actually now we have a domestic violence court where those cases that do get prosecuted get special attention and they are required to go through treatment. So it's it's very good. I'm, I'm pleased with what's being done. Um, and I think that years ago when the police arrived at a, at a domestic violence scene, they would ask the, the woman, to leave the house and stay in a hotel. And that is so old, you know, and it's really become very, very appropriate. So I appreciate all that you do. Thank you. So with that, um, is there a recommendation to accept the report? Would one of the I members- No, I don't, I don't think we, there's no- um... You don't have to do that. Yeah, there's no votes. It's just it's just a time for you guys to provide feedback that we okay. can um, enter into our annual report. Well, I'm accepting it. <laughs> Thank you. So now we move on to the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Although it's written here, recommendation to accept the informal report. It so does. I, that's why. I think we can just say yes. You accept? Do you accept it? Yeah, I accept it. <laughs> okay. So is the membership in agreement that we're accepting the report? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. Now we can move on. So I understand that Sergeant Rob Clellan is going to give us um, a presentation on use of force. So thank you. But before we start, is the translation, is everything working well with yes. the translation? This will be a good time to toggle interpreters. Once. Okay. That's what he's checking. She, we we started late. The question was, was the online working? And I think it's because we started late, but there are uh, five or six people that are online. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We're good to go. Sergeant Clellan, thank you. All right. Good evening. Thank good evening. you for allowing me to present to you guys today. I appreciate you guys taking the time out to listen to us. Um, again, I'm Sergeant Rob Cleland. I've been with the San Rafael Police Department for 19 years. Um, I'm currently a self-defense and tactics instructor, firearms instructor, use of force instructor, taser instructor, um, active shooter response instructor. Um, and I'll be giving you a brief presentation on use of force today. Um, so our officers at the San Rafael Police Department are governed and required to follow federal case law, uh, state law, and department. Um, police must always follow department policy. Um, <clears throat> and those the federal case law is Graham v. Connor, Tennessee v. Gardner, and then the state law is 835A, which is the use force um, penal code law. And then our policy is Lexpol 300. Uh, Graham v. Connor was a 1989 Supreme Court decision that established an objective um, reasonableness standard for when an officer can legally use force on a suspect and how much force can be used. And that's usually based on uh, what they know and perceive at the time. 
and that force must be reasonable. Um, and it's judged by a person, um, a reasonable officer on scene at that time. And again, that was in 1989. Um, the other federal case law standard is Tennessee v. Gardner. Um, this is also known as the fleeing felon rule. Um, in 1985, the Supreme Court decision established that an officer may use deadly force to prevent a, the escape of a fleeing suspect with the belief that the suspect poses significant threat or death or serious physical injury to officers or others if not immediately apprehended. And this stemmed from, um, obviously, in Tennessee, where a subject um, broke into a residential house and they're a burglary suspect. So no violence, but a property crime. And that person was shot by the police um, back then. So um, so that case law dis um, decision changed the way that police do that with um, fleeing felony suspects. Um, and we'll get a little bit into that in a little bit. Penal Code 835A, um, it's the California Penal Code. It was rewritten to state law 2020 after the passage of AB 392, and that's Assembly Bill 392. Penal Code 835 set the guidelines when officers in California can use force um, upon a person up to including deadly force. And then our San Rafael Lexable policy. Um, so this policy provides guidelines on when reasonable um, use of force. While there is no way to specify the exact amount of or type of force, um, to be applied in any situation, every member of this department is expected to use guidelines set in 835 PC in this policy to make sure decisions um, and professional and partial in a reasonable manner. And that's under government code 7286. Um, policy 300 includes um, duty to intercede, reporting excessive force, and carrying out their duties in a fair and unbiased manner. Um, altered alternative tactics and de-escalation, reporting and investigating the use of force, medical considerations um, that we need to do after use of force, um, supervisory um, supervisor responsibilities, and then of course training. Um, so we are required to do biannual training um, on use of force, arrest of control, um, the use of a taser, firearms, things like that. Um, and that, and that training includes arrest control techniques, um, what can be basically control holds, um, basically if you place somebody in a risk, risk control hold, um, or you're using techniques to bring them safely into custody, we, we train those, um, and it includes handcuffing, um, alternate ways to transport them. If they're actively violent and kicking us, we have a uh, maximum restraint that we, you know, put around their ankles, things like that. And then we, we train on proper um, transportation to the hospital or jail if need to. So we, that's included in the training. Um, and every training on use of force, we include duty to intercede and also the consequences um, that if you fail to report that excessive force or fail to intercede in that excessive force. Uh, we review the duty to request and render medical aid. All other subjects um, covered in this policy also include the use of deadly force, the ban on choke holds and carotid holds, discharge of a firearm at a moving vehicle, verbal warnings prior to deadly force. Um, so back in 2020, um, the initiative, it was a uh, mayor's pledge, I believe. Uh, we will never wait or also known as eight can't wait. Um, <clears throat> so we were very proactive in that and we um, had our policy reviewed very quickly and implemented the changes uh, to our policy. And that um, also included, so the review and changes to our policy of ban of chokeholds, um, requirement of de-escalation when feasible, a, providing a verbal warning before deadly force when feasible, and then uh, exhausting other means when feasible. So alternative resources, um, and we can, we'll talk about the safe team a little bit, uh, mobile crisis, things like that, um, crisis negotiators um, when they're available. Uh, continued of the eight, eight can't wait, um, duty to intercede was entered into our policy. And again, uh, what happens if you fail, if you're a failure to do so? Um, the ban on shooting at moving vehicles was added to our policy. So um, that includes, um, so if, the, if a threat from a vehicle is coming at you, you're trying to, you're, you're supposed to take every effort to move out of the way of, the, of that vehicle coming towards you. Um, it doesn't prevent us from shooting at a vehicle if 
something that other than the vehicle is coming towards us. So if they're firing a gun at us from the vehicle, we can shoot at the moving vehicle. So that's part of it. Um, a force continuum, um, which is um, the level of force. So what force option you're, you're going to use. We, we train on um, when feasible to try to use other resources and other the most limited force as possible. Um, but it also allows us to make split se second decisions, which is in 835A. And if we need to go directly to a firearm, we're allowed to do that. And then also part of the eight can't wait was uh, more comprehensive reporting to the DOJ. So all use of forces that um, result in um, serious and um, significant injury have to report it to the DOJ yearly. So when can officer use force? That's the big question. So when a person has committed a public offense, an officer may use a objectively reasonable amount of force based on the totality of the circumstances known or perceived to the officer at the time. And they can do this to affect an arrest, overcome resistance, and prevent escape. An officer can use deadly force for two reasons. A peace officer is justified in using deadly force upon another person only when the officer reasonably believes, based on the totality of circumstances, that such force necessary for either of the following reasons. And again, totality of circumstances is all information known to that officer um, at the time. So it's the initial call, what he's been told by dispatch. It could be priors at the residence or with that person, things like that. And then obviously the crime that they're wanted for. So the first reason, uh, defend against an imminent threat of death or seriously bodily injury to the officer or any other member of the public. Uh, we we teach, it, teach it as POA. Um, the suspect must present all of the following in order to use deadly force. So the P uh, represents present ability. So they must have a, a weapon or a means to cause great bodily injury or death. Um, the opportunity the opportunity would be the officers or the people in close proximity to the public um, that they could be potential victims. And the also, also the other thing that's needed is uh, to be able to prove apparent intent. So that could be through their actions or their statements. And since 2020, this law was rewritten and it hasn't been tested in court yet. So we 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 teach that you need to be able to articulate what the person is doing to show intent, right? So we may not always know their intent, um, but based on their actions and statements, it may be able to lead to us of what they're intending to do if they're intending to harm somebody. And then the second reason um, to apprehend a fleeing person for any felony that threatened or resulted in death or serious bodily injury if the officer reasonably believes that the person will cause death or serious bodily injury to another unless immediately apprehended. And again, that'd be the fleeing felon rule. Um, so threats to self only was also placed in into the um, penal code. So if a person is threatening violence only to themselves, uh, threatening suicide or something like that, the peace officer shall not use deadly force against a person based on the danger that that person presents um, just to themselves. If an objectively reasonable officer would believe the person does not pose an imminent threat to, or death or serious body injury to the peace officer or another person, they cannot use deadly force against that person. Um, so going into in use of force investigations. So every use of force is reviewed uh, by a supervisor um, and they're required to respond to the scene at the time. Um, and then the, that supervisor will, will gather statements, interview the victim, interview witnesses in the area, um, briefly talk to the officers to see what happened, um, and then conduct an investigation. He'll write a use of force, um, report and they they advise their, their supervisors. So usually a Lieutenant above the Sergeant or a supervisor will be advised that a use of force was used and a, a use of force report was completed. That report will be forwarded to the administration and they will review it and see if it's within policy and law. Um, and then the last person to review it is an instructor staff member, someone like me. <clears throat> and I've been an instructor staff uh, for six years out of my 19 years. So now I re review um, all the use of force. Um, and we we take that information and usually by the time it gets to me, it's we know um, administration has made a decision if it's if it's within policy. Um, so I review it to enhance our training. So we 
I, I look at it. I review the video, I review the reports and look at some things we can do. You are, you're able to do that for us, but is there an alternate way you can handle it? Could you have done this to maybe keep yourself safe or others safe? Um, and we look at the totality of circumstances. Was it feasible at the time? Um, and then we, we put that into our annual training or biannual training if it needs to be, and we bring it up and discuss it and sometimes show the use of force reports um, or videos to see how we can learn from each mistake, if we made any, or just how you get better um, and better serve our public. Um, and then any use of force believed to be excessive um, is thoroughly investigated, um, whether internal or external, that'd be up to Chief Spiller to make the decision if it's gonna be investigated internally or externally. So what does the San Rafael Police Department do to ensure officers use a necessary force? Um, we strive to exceed the minimum training standards set by POST. POST is a police officer's standards and training. Um, and which again, it's biannual training for each of those use, use support pl platforms. So arrest control, taser, firearms, and, and things like that. And we often exceed those minimum standards um, every year. We send officers to specialized training, um, CIT, which is um, cr critical incident training. So how to deal with people with mental illness, um, dealing people with cri in crisis. Um, so every officer usually within their first 18 months is sent to CIT training. And I believe that's a four day um, training usually put on here in Marin County. We incorporate de-escalation to all our use of force, even firearms use of force. So out on the range, we also use de-escalation tactics um, so giving verbal warnings beforehand, trying to, you know, build rapport if, if needed. Um, and also on the range, we, um, uh, practice with our less lethal, um, weapons. Um, so less lethal beanbag shotgun or a less lethal 40 millimeter launcher. And those weapons allow us to get, um, time and distance to deescalate the situation, um, before we have to resort to the use of force with a firearm. So we train that out on the range, um, in all our trainings. Um, and we expect our officers to police with respect and compassion for our community. Um, like we strive to use the least amount of force necessary uh, to affect our arrests. Um, and that is also talked about in our training, how dealing with our public is, is number one, treating them with respect. And we use, use, use force as a last resort when needed. Um, so the San Rafael Police Department uses alternate resources in addition to patrol officers. So we're the first and only um, city in the county to have the safe team. Um, and they're, I think you guys have had presentations with the safe team already, and they're very good at um, dealing with the calls that don't require a police response, right? And that um, is known that people suffering mental illness often don't respond well to police departments and often result in use of force, um, which we have the safe team out there now, and now those will limit those use of forces against the people um, that sometimes don't respond well to the police. We also have mobile crisis, which is a county asset, um, and they're allowed to come out and place people on a mental evaluation holds, 5150 holds, um, and they come without without police, and they can handle it. And sometimes it's a little violent. We'll go as a co-response and help them um, to alleviate use of force. And then also we have uh, CNT, which is crisis negotiations team, which um, I'm currently the crisis negotiation te team leader, um, which I'm part of. Um, so we have members that are um, in patrol that can be accessed um, for you know critical incidents and they can be called in to negotiate with people in a crisis. Um, so that is also another layer of de-escalation for them. So the use force stats. So um, we deal with a lot of calls in the city. We're, we're a very busy uh, little city in Marin. So we handled just over 44,000 calls for service. In 2023, we made 1,653 arrests. And out of all of those arrests, um, only 53 resulted in a use of force. Um, so that's 0.12% of the calls for service resulted in use of force. So I think it's pretty low in San Rafael um, based on those numbers. I think we strive to um, you know, make a culture of de-escalation only resulting to force when we need to. Um, being here for 19 years, I was a student of instructors uh, for 13 years. And they, since I've been here, they've always said, you know, de-escalation, take your time, only use the force reasonable. 
And now being an instructor for the past six years, I take it upon myself to teach every officer um, that that same role. So we currently just finished an eight hour use of force training, um, which is now state mandated. Um, and it, it really allowed our officers to see how they have to think critically. And our ultimate goal is not to use force against people. And the training was very good. So obviously it's a very busy town in San Rafael. Um, you know, 44,000 calls a year. And I think it's a testament to our culture that we try to use the least amount of as force as reasonable. Um, in the past 25 years, we've only had two officer involved shootings and those are very violent incidents. And um, so I think it's, it just shows that we, with all these calls for service we handle, we result to that very last. So um, I want to thank you for letting me present to you guys. Um, but that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you so much for that very excellent presentation. We really appreciate your time and your service to do all the training, thank you. which is great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, are there any questions from the committee to Sergeant Clellan? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, why don't we start with member? Yeah. Oh, well, because you're so enthusiastic. Go ahead. Salamat. Thank you. I really appreciate the uh, statistics for 2023. Uh, one question before I get into the report, one question I've always wanted to ask is if somebody is holding a knife, threatening you, because I have done police um, shooting training in the military, okay. just brief, because I'm a nurse, so we don't do a whole bunch, you know. Um, why is it that you always aim for the, you know, the, the torso rather than maybe the arm, which is holding the knife? I've always wanted to know, or if they're running towards you, why not the thigh, which would stop them from running towards you rather than the torso? I've always wanted to ask that question as a citizen on the planet, you know, yeah. instead of aiming at the largest part, which obviously you aim at the largest part. Why is that not part of the, talking about the use of force, what does that mean? You know, I mean, use of force, you've got lots of force. It's all on your body. Mm -hmm. I'm not understanding why that's not implemented in that way. Mm -hmm. Can you answer that question first and then I'll get to my next question. Yeah, so I think it's, um, we've I, usually, if someone's with a knife, it's all those means of being exhausted and it's an immediate threat to us. And basically if you're going for the arm, we're human, it's very hard to hit an arm or a knife shooting out of the I hand, know, right? Um, but but also it's been tested and seen that um, if you if you shoot in the leg, that person can still continue their advance and still harm you because you 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 don't either bleed out or you still have power. You still can walk for several minutes. So we're we're trying to stop the threat immediately on our attack. So going for vital organs would stop that threat. Because you can be shot in the arm, you can be shot in the leg, and still continue your attack on us usually. And you don't know how to retreat or move out of the way. It's usually when we've already been through that, and we're okay, just, using time and distance and less saying, lethal, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I had a question about the use of um, of the dogs. Where's my piece of? Where's my? I wrote this down. I prepared this. Um, I understand that on the books, there's AB 3241 about reporting on canine teams. Uh, do you have information on that today as to um, there's been some concern amongst the population of how uh, dogs are used uh, or misused or interpreted as being misused and the violence amongst those usually are without weapons have been the, the numbers that have been reported to me. Not, I mean, when I say numbers, that's what, you know, generalizing is what I'm saying has been reported. Do you folks have information about this law if it's going forward? Um, or, or maybe I'm addressing Ms. Olson. Um, and, um, and are reportings done about the canine incidents? Because I would consider a canine um, deployed would be a use of force and maybe excessive force. What have you to say about that? 
So I'm I'm aware that the use of a canine is use of force and be documented under use of force. Mm -hmm. uh, but I believe Chief Spiller may have more information on it because I don't run the canine program. Right now, um, we've been without a police service dog for three plus years. Um, so our reporting dates back to the last time we had a dog. We retired our last dog uh, in- So we don't have a canine don't. unit? Oh, okay. we don't. Oh. Uh, we are going to stand up again uh, because of staffing and other operational impacts. We have been without a police service dog program. Uh, so we have not been reporting since we haven't had a dog. Uh, the legislation you're making reference to is in the wake of other uh, state legislation um, requiring um, the classification of uh, canine deployment as lethal force. Uh, that uh, legislation was defeated, and I think it's going to be coming back to the legislature. I don't know what its current status is, but I can't speak to, I cannot right now speak to the status of that legislation. I believe it was uh, S uh, AB 742 was the last. Yeah. I didn't research thoroughly to find out what happened to 3241, but I know 2042 and 742 were, you know, uh, didn't pass. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rees, do you have any questions? Yes. I have a question. Uh, bueno, tengo una pregunta. ¿Cuántos oficiales pueden usar la fuerza en una persona? How many people can use force uh, against another person? That's a good question. That's an excellent question. Um, so it's whatever is reasonable at the time, given the circumstances. So it, it may depend on um, what weapon they have, their level of resistance. Lo que sea razonable en, en el momento. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you. And do you have any additional questions? No. no? Okay, member Om. There was a reference to um, situations that we might need to go to an internal or external investigation. Chief, what, what are your parameters on wh when you would take it to an outside? Uh, it just depends on the situation. Uh, management capacity. So if, if a supervisor was involved, for example, and we needed to utilize a command staff officer to investigate whether they had the capacity to do it or not, or whether we wanted to use an outside resource, um, typically... Uh, and, a, a, you know, an objective, independent outside investigator can uh, better serve us in the eyes of the community from an objectivity perspective. Um, there are times when the administrative work of nine sergeants, four lieutenants, and a couple of my captains is such that it makes more sense from a workload perspective to farm it out. But all of our supervisors, all of our command staff members are trained and able to uh, facilitate investigations like this or any administrative investigation. And, and follow up when we farm it out, is that, are we partnering with the sheriff or another um, local entity? Uh, typically it would be a, a, a private investigator that has law enforcement experience. Understood. Mr. Davidi. Uh, thank you, Sergeant, for your report. Um, on your last slide, I was trying to see the patterns of uh, calls. I took a picture of it. But I just want to make sure overall, some of them are increasing, some of them decreasing. Do, can you, do you mind putting up that last slide? And you, you had some small notes in red. I was curious to know where the trends are with these um, arrests. I only have the one-year average, I believe. Was the five-year average placed in their packet? Do you know, Teresa? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you, can you speak to the five-year trend? Uh, the five-year trend uh, is also included in the packet and as well as in the staff report, which averaged uh, arrests compared to calls for service over the last five years uh, leading up to 2023 and overall has been a decline. Thank you. I do have some questions. I wanted to piggyback on the questions regarding gay nine. Um, 
seen a lot of vicious animals out there in the you know in public um and then i i didn't know i have no idea that that uh you know san rafael local pd doesn't have canine for the last three years um i mean like i would love to see that come back because i would rather see someone you know just hold down by a dog <laughs> than got shot you know um Not necessarily i mean like you know if if you if you have to weigh in the two options, I'd rather have someone pinned down by a dog and you can fix that. You can't fix someone who got shot and died. You know? Um, that's just me. You know, but and I've I've seen that I've I have a lot of cousins in the force uh, in other countries. So I've I've seen them deal with these stuff. But my question's about K9, like how do you when do you call in the K9 unit? If, if we have the K9 unit and the other one, how do you guys deal with, with vicious animals out there? You know, um, I've seen some like, you know, dogs on leash, but not all of them on leash, you know, uh, with the previous job that I've done, like we, we don't go to a lot of these areas because of loose animals and they're very vicious. You know, I got bit twice. Um, some of my fellow workers, they don't want to go there. So how do you guys deal with those situations, you know? Yeah, so taking those two uh, questions in order. So the standards for deployment or utilization of a police service dog, uh, typically they're assigned to a patrol shift. They work a beat. Um, instead of a human partner, they have a four-legged partner. Um, th those officers assigned to, uh, deploy a canine, uh, police service dog, they handle their calls, they handle their reports on the beat, but they also, uh, are trained to respond to critical incidents. Uh, they typically either participate in or respond to the termination of a police pursuit, depending on the want and the nature of, uh, uh, the pursuit, uh, we have suspects who have fled and we've got what we think is a contained perimeter. We have lost children and that would be like an on leash search for a, a lost child. Uh, we use the canine for article searches. If we're, if we think, uh, evidence or, uh, a weapon was discarded in the course of a foot pursuit or vehicular pursuit or any flight of a suspect. So there's a lot of different deployments. The canine handlers uh, go through a lot, underscore a lot of training. And, um, you know, their basic training, they're bonding with a the dog they're, because we procure a dog and it includes bonding time. It includes basic training. And then there's ongoing training with state certification. Those certification criteria include like call off, like if a, the dog gets sent, and the suspect complies, the dog has to stop mid dash and lay down. So all of those types of things are, are performance standards and all of the um, types of activity that I just mentioned are typical utilizations for a police service dog. Um, again, depending on the nature, it would be an on leash, you know, long lead uh, search for like a missing uh, juvenile or missing subject person at risk. Or it could be, uh, you know, the, the uh, suspect, like I said, who's in flight. Uh, does that answer the first part? Yes. Okay. The second part was our response to vicious animals. We utilize, uh, by contract, a uh, humane society in Marin County, um, and they are primary responders by contract, and they'll handle, um, um, I forget the word. Um, if, if they have a vicious dog or a rabid dog, or if they have to quarantine is the word I forgot, uh, a dog that they're take, they take the lead, but if there's like a life safety issue with a vicious animal, we're, we're going to respond to that. And the officers will do their level best with the tools that they have to contain it and control it without, uh, exposing the public to any more danger than it was already, uh, present. Oh, cool. thank you. Um, I, sorry, I have. Maybe one other question. Um, you mentioned verbal warnings. Oh. Is there is there a, a number of verbal warnings? Um, the only reason why I asked that because you also mentioned the force continuum. Um, 
I don't know where in that continuum, uh, you know, comes the, the verbal warnings, drawings, you know, um, using a force. Because I know like it's, it it's, it's probably too hard and so hard to, it's tough for those guys to, and women stepping out in uniform and charging what's going on, you know, at the time when it happens. So, I don't know, it might be a stupid question. No, uh, it's not. Stupid. My apologies, but where in that continuum line is, you know, I just want to see, if, I don't know, if you can draw a picture just to give us a big picture of it. Yeah, so I think it depends on every situation is different, right? So we we train to put out a verbal um, identification, first identifying ourselves as the police department. Um, and it all depends on how how fast this situation is evolving. Um, but when feasible, we were trained and required to put out a, a, a warning, say, you know, Santa Fe Police Department, if you don't drop the knife, you could be shot, or something like that along those lines. So giving a warning of, you know, what they're doing is, going to may cause force and this is the force is going to be used and trying to give them time to comply with that um, before we have to use force so we we train to try to put it out as early as possible but you never know i mean it can be split right. second decision someone charging at us or something like that or um well you don't have time so the, the law also covers that um only when feasible so if you don't have time and something happens within seconds you're not gonna have time to say you know please you're gonna get shot if you don't stop thank you does that answer your questions? Yes. Miss Nguyen, do you have any questions? Well, I just, I just wanted to comment as um, in a case, uh, you have a warning first, but then did you consider the persons that you warning have a little mental and, and they're very nervous and they're still uh, holding the like a weapon or, or the knife or something like dangerous. So did you consider you, you after the warning you you the gun to shoot or uh, or what 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 would you do in that situation? Um yeah, so after a verbal warning, we we try to give time to comply, um, <clears throat> and doing that so with time and distance. So if they have a knife. Time and distance is our best friend, right? So they can't stab me unless they get very close to me. So we try to maintain time and distance, giving that warning, telling them to com comply. And if we need to use less lethal options first or other de-escalation de techniques, bring in alternate resources to slow the, the thing down, we'll, we'll try that when feasible. I, uh, I said that because there's a couple of years, long time, ago i know that one vietnamese uh, families she was shot by the police officers and she have a little mantles uh, and she i think that time she hold the knife and the police i don't know what's happened but then the police i don't know if they warning first but then they just shot when they see her it just happened like that so i'm just concerned as uh, Okay, I don't believe that happened in San Rafael, so I, I can't speak uh, on No, Korea, not but, in San Rafael, in uh, LA, <laughs> in, in uh, Southern California. Yeah, so yeah. the entire state is governed under 835A and that in that case law, so um, I'm not sure. I can't speak on that case. I don't, I don't have the oh, okay. details of it. Miss, are you done, Miss Ways? Yeah. Miss Alvarez, do you have any questions? Um, no, my committee members had some pretty good questions. So. Okay. Um, I, sorry, I, go I ahead. have another question. I can go right ahead. And I do too. Yeah, she might have. Um, this is again, like, you know, I do you guys, uh, I don't know if this is on, on your DMV test when you take the test, you know, like if you got pulled over by cops, like the only thing. I, I don't even remember, but so for, I hope they're not watching me. They might take my license if I fail. Uh, <laughs> you know, like we when you got pulled over, like, you know, both hands on wheels, um, a lot of the immig immigrants to, to San Rafael or to any city, um, if they don't have their license or 
or they're driving under, you know, an expired license. Um, some people, they drive without a license, you know, and some folks, they, they don't understand, or maybe they don't understand that. Do you guys affiliate it with DMV regarding that or no? No, we're not affiliated with DMV, okay. uh, but we, you know, simple traffic stops, we, you know, police officers are training and talking and dealing with people every day, all day, 12 hours a day. Um, so I think we're very good at reading people's behavior, um, how they're acting. Uh, we understand that, you know, we, we serve an immigrant community yeah, and we have a lot of officers that speak Spanish, which really helps um, with that communication barrier there. Um, but yeah, just simple traffic stop. Of course, we're always aware of how they're acting, but it's right. Yeah. You know, I don't know if we, we don't contract with DMV and teach them how to do it because they're just driving a car and they can kind of react however they like to us. It, for those watching at home, it's not a law, but it sure is a good idea to have those hands up on right. the steering wheel. It's just, there's a lot going on with the traffic stop, you know, traffic's whizzing by the police officer who initiated the stop has no idea what's going on in the car. And they suspect, you know, they know why they stopped the car for vehicle code violation or whatever, but um, yeah, not a law to have your hands up right. on the steering wheel visible, but sure is a good idea. So I can tell my wife, it's not a law. Feel free. But you should but, put your hands on the wheel. It's it's it's, it's at first. Yeah. It's the only warning she gave me when I moved to the state in two thousand and seven. Yeah. Drive, but if you got pulled over by police, please put two hands on the wheels. Um, you know. My my last question is just on your slide. There was a CNT. I know crisis. I just wanted the full. Crisis intervention training. Crisis negotiation team. Negotiation, negotiation team. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Ms. Locks, you yes. have another question. Yeah. We we mentioned mental health, and you're. I, I'm assuming that there's some training around uh, de -esc with the de-escalation, maybe identifying that the person's disoriented. I mean, sure, surely you're trained on the person's high on drugs, of course, right? What about those that are actually? I'm thinking of the older population. And as well as, what about if they can't hear the commands? What if they, I mean, what if, let's say, they make a movement to say, or whatever the, are, have the, um, that's uh, HLAA, the hearing loss group here in the county ever interface with police officers to let them know maybe how to assess or to um, identify, uh, recognize maybe a hard of hearing persons because one thing we're saying not to use our hands and they have to use their hands all the time for communication. So has that been thought about or utilized and so forth when you're making that command, waiting for a response that you would be typically waiting for the response from someone like me, but not necessarily someone who couldn't hear, never heard the response, is trying to read your lips, or maybe you got a mask on, maybe they've got a mask. You know what I'm saying? All of those variables, I want to know about the hard of hearing, because you mentioned time to respond. And if you're responding with your hands in sign language, that might be construed as threatening. Your response, sir? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's scenario training in the academy, there's advanced um, training uh, for uh, in-service and uh, defensive tactics. It's, um, you know, the officer is, I won't say forced, the officer is presented with a certain set of circumstances. And based on, you know, that reasonable person who, you know, I won't call it a sixth sense, but, you know, somebody who, you know, somebody who's using American sign language as an example, that doesn't come across as a threat. If somebody was reaching for a card that says hard of hearing or deaf, you know, this kind of a movement is very different than a, this kind of a movement. So the officer is simply trained to react and present to the circumstances that they're presented with. Um, in my career and lifetime, we have worked with different associations who want to provide training to uh, the organization uh, when presented with special circumstances like that. But uh, there are things that we could all each think of in terms of a confrontation or a realization that a police officer might be confronted with, but we're trained to do our very best with what's presented, including 
uh, leveling our experience and our training uh, to handle the uh, encounter as effectively as possible without the need for physical force. Yeah, not not a rapidly evolving situation, but we also do subscribe to a um, American Sign Language service, and we have iPads that we can deploy to the field. So if it was a, a longer, like a negotiation, the crisis negotiation team can use that iPad delivered to the house using one of our robots or something like that. And we'd be able to use that service to talk to them. So that's great. So we'll close the time for questions and I don't um, see any public, but actually this will be the time if you have any just general comments about the presentation. We'll start this way with Ms. Alvarez. Um. The presentation was great. Uh, he answered every question well said. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Ms. Nguyen, do you just have any comments you'd like to make? No, I I, I have questions. So okay, I just, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Tokalai? I do. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, thank you. That was great. Uh, I loved it. I learned a lot in such a very short time. I wrote down a lot of stuff. I'm going to go home, do some research on it. I love this stuff. Um, and this is great info for, for the public too. You know, for those who are listening, dig into this kind of stuff, you know, so, you know, research like today is everything is online, you know? Um, and, and I encourage people to do this learn about what you guys have done, you know, what you guys are doing and going through. I, I appreciate the, you know, the, the presentation. I also like you highlighted four bullet points on what the SFBD, the SF, the San Rafael BD is doing. Sorry. My apologies, SF. <laughs> um, you mentioned the, you know, you guys are incorporating de-escalating to use of force, um, sit dealing with mental health. That's a big thing in, in, in the city, especially there's a lot of, uh, folks on the street, uh, also just regular people who are not on the street, but they're going through some of these issues, you know, um, it's, it's hard to identify them. You know, it's, it's harder to work with them, you know, to solve some of these issues. Um, I also like that you tap into using the alternates, the safe team. We all love the safe team and what they do, you know, uh, the mobile crisis. Um, I'm going to dig in and learn about the crisis, the CNT, you know, uh, this is great. And just to see police policing with compassion and respect, you know, to the people um, in the city. So I this is great stuff. Uh, and, and just wanted to thank you for that. So, yeah. Thank you. Mr. Yes. Um, one of the things I learned about the usefulness of the canine, I mean, I think if that's one thing, if the city has a budget or something, maybe more of a recommendation, if we can pursue that more actively to have a canine unit, uh, I think I see big benefits um, all around. Um, the, I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Alam. Oh, I, I know I'm not supposed to respond to that, but I, I, I shared in my response earlier that we were going, we we're intending to redeploy. Uh, so that is going to happen. We've actually identified the handler. Uh, there's a lot of training that has to come, uh, but that might be something that Lieutenant Everly puts on your 25 calendar. Um, we can do an introduction and an overview of the program, including the the new uh, police service dogs experience. Hopefully we get to meet the puppy next year. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Just as long as I don't shed in here. <laughs> Member all, do you need comments? If I were to add a comment to our report, I, I would encourage and, and recommend more external investigations if we have to es escalate it. I think I would appreciate more independence and also to take that burden off of our supervisors so they can just do their job. Thank you. Ms. Ruiz, do you have any comments? No, I don't have, but I would like to say only thank you so much for the explanation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Member Logs, do you have any questions? Excuse me, comments? 
great presentation. My questions were answered, and I, like other members of the committee, will be continuing to research this particular topic because it is the reason that why we are here. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And my comment is thank you so much. Um, I would have loved to have heard a demonstration of the police voice that's giving the commands, but that's okay. No, <laughs> it's very different than what's here today. Oh, I don't know. I don't want to bear. <laughs> okay, but thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. And Chief, thank you also. Um, Chair, I don't I... think demonstration is out of the the realm of our committee. Perhaps we have to have a special committee for having some demonstrations as we go maybe more more deeply into the use of force is one of the things we had talked Sorry. about. Noted. And we're, is we going to take a quick 30-second oh. break to swap the Okay, transfers. yeah. Thank you. No, we, we have asked for a, um, I don't know what term you want to use, like a truck, like a pretend scenario to see what that's like. I know, we have to, uh, well, yeah, well, it can be noticed, it just, maybe nobody will come here, just do it online. Oh, oh, yeah. Lieutenant, are the we are ready to go? Yes, go ahead. Of course. Uh, although the people that are online are are listening or watching or whatever, do they write comments or call in? Do they have any participatory? No, process? no, just yeah, no, just as a reminder, as we have been doing this since last December, is you have to be in person. Um, to participate live during the meetings, um, to uh, give any comments, um, but you there is a PAC email, so the packet does go out, you know, at least 72 hours. We usually are well ahead of that, and they're able to write any comments they want in the form of an email, and we will publish them with the packet like we've done before as well. I received some phone calls. So my question is, did we did we have any this time? That was really my question. Did we have any this time? No, not there, this time. There are panelists. I mean, not panelists, excuse me. There are t attendees that are listening live right now. No, I mean, but no correspondence. No correspondence. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, there was no correspondence. I apologize. Thank you. Okay. So are we recommending to accept this report? No? Yes? Yes. 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 Fine. The report is accepted. So now would be the time for a staff liaison report. Do you have anything? Yeah, real real quick, just to go over next month, we are uh, aiming to go over so schools um, or youth and policing. Uh -huh. um, we're trying to get um, a training in there. I don't want to promise it's just going to be contingent on the presenter's availability, but I am um, really looking forward to next month's presentation on youth and policing. I also want to remind everybody that the PAC ride-alongs are up for your sign-up. If you haven't seen it or can't access it, you can also send me an email separately and I could plug you in. Thank you. That's all I got. Okay, thank you so much. Um... So now would be the time for committee members to give a report of their activities, if they, if you wish. So we'll start with down at this end of the table with Alvarez. Um, my report would be talking to the to my neighborhood. I'm sorry. Talking to my neighborhood, which is um, a lot of uh, assaults on the. Uh, teenagers and attacks around canal so that's worrisome to many people especially hearing them at night so thank you maybe they can you can encourage them to come to the next meeting since it's on youth please the thought 
Yeah. Ms. Newen, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Uh, no, for this time, no. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Member Takalai, Vice Chair. Excuse me. Yes, just one quickly. Um, there's a group of mostly all, all of them are Latinos. Uh, not they're not all from the canal. Uh, some of them live in the canal. Some of them live in the broader San Rafael communities. Um, they're all outreach workers, frontline. So I I check in with them pretty much every week. Um, so yeah, things are good. Think things are. I mean, like it's looking positive. Good. Yeah. So. Thank you, Mr. Davidi. Yes. Uh, we recently visited Darlene's um pickle weed, the Cub Scout League that she um co facilitates. Um, it was nice that we all kind of got together and. When in person, I think us four, I think yeah. we're there. Um, we're mindful of the Brown Act. <laughs> um, and it was nice that Paul initiated. It was nice that we all kind of uh, went together. Um, just wanted to applaud your family for all the hard work they do on the canal, your son. It's amazing that uh, those grassroots, those young age kids who get involved, and it was very inspiring. You know, they have a, the leader name is William. And I know that he's looking to expand the Cub Scout. It's you know very affordable. It's a nice way for kids in the canal to be involved in something meaningful, pur purposeful, that rebuilds their community and they have a sense of pride. Um, and I also noticed how important it is to have some team building maybe moments with the, within ourselves here. Because as much as I know you guys, I think it creates more, um, I don't know, it feels more meaningful that get to know Darlene's, you know, a neighborhood, or if there's opportunities where we can connect outside here, uh, I think it's a, it's a great way to kind of build on on what we're doing. Great. Thank you so much. Member Ong? I have a couple of things to report. Um, Weston neighborhood has hosted a long history of hosting a national night out event. And thank you, Chief Scott and Teresa Mayor came by and a lot of first, re first responders from the fire department team really enjoyed the interaction with the community. It's greatly appreciated. Um, I also had coffee with Teresa. It was great to have a little one-on-one -on -one with her, um, get to know each other um, and uh, just set up a, a line of communication. I encourage my, my peers here to um, uh, meet up with her too. Um, thank you for inviting us. It was a really great um, uh, event. Um, to participate in the uh, Court of Honor. Uh, I really, it, it, it's a great place of community. And uh, I would encourage um, just more community participation and I hope we can expand it. Uh, I was a little bit disheartened that there's only five members in the troop. It's a little sad. And, um, and there's a huge opportunity to bring that together. It would be a great asset for the community. Thank you for keeping it going. Thank you. M Member Ruiz, do you have any comments, please? Yes, I was in the meeting from Pico Will Committee on August 7. Yeah, like a, like a 30 minutes, 40 minutes yeah. was short meeting. Um, and well, with the, every Mondays we have a meeting with uh, Boy Scout. And right now we are going to start one uh, pilot program with girls too. And we are learning about that because the person was in this uh, team. He no more is with us. Only sometimes he came to teach how we are continuous. Uh, this is why uh, some children left because mm -hmm. he wasn't more with us. But uh, we try to continue. And this Friday in movie night, we are going to invite more children, about 11 to 17. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Member Locks, do you have anything yes. to report? Um, I attended our... Uh, San Rafael City Council meeting up Monday evening. Uh, the pro presentation on homelessness and what our city is doing. And, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion about 
a summated word would be criminality that occurs with some of the tented areas. And, um, but some of the solutions were looking good, but definitely not enough. Um, they're planning to do 47 tented, shelter, tent, tented shelters. And the number of homeless is much greater than 47. So, um, but it's a first step. And I think that there's actual active involvement with uh, policing and safety and so forth. And so I wanted to commend our our uh, police force with um, their involvement in helping with that situation that I see it as not being solved very soon and only possibly increasing as the number of those who are 50 and above. Uh, that is the increasing number of people that are becoming homeless because of rents, basically. And we have a lot of seniors that have not been counted in the numbers mm -hmm. that are living in cars and um, other kinds of vehicles like up in Nevada, as we all know. So I wanted to thank um, the involvement that our police are doing with that project. Thank you so much. Well, th thank you again for all of your work and your presentations. And thank you. And I see no public to make comments. And I think we're done. So the meeting is adjourned. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you.